You're listening to the Front Row Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number seven. Hey guys, it's Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and you're listening to the Front Row Entrepreneur Podcast with our girl, Jen. Thanks for that intro, Gary. If you've been following along with the Front Row Entrepreneur Podcast, you know that the reason this even exists is because I heard Gary Vaynerchuk on James Altucher's podcast, and he said this. Listen, honestly, left turn. Here, here's what we're doing. I'm going to do something wild right now because I can feel it. It just bubbled up. If you are start, If you are listening right now and you actually start your first two episodes of a podcast because of this around whatever... I don't give a fuck. Jelly, you know, uh, sneakers, um, you know, buying, st- if you start this, I'll definitely love it. Going to garage sales, buying stuff and flipping it. You know, whatever it is, you know, if you do it off of this, because we know the date this will air and I can see and I'll do the homework, hit me up on Twitter, say hashtag I started Gary V, right? Or I want James in it. Gary V and James, I started. Long hashtag because I need to filter them. But if you've actually taken the first step and have done two episodes of your podcast, I will come and make surprise five-minute appearances on all of them. All right, I will match you on that as well. So I was out walking my dog when I heard this and literally did a 180 and headed right back to my office. I learned how to do a podcast, then I created my first two episodes, and I did all that in about 36 hours. And then I got busy tweeting the heck out of James Altucher and Gary Vaynerchuk. And if you don't know who these two gentlemen are, they are best-selling authors. And as that guy in Napoleon Dynamite said, kind of a big deal. Having them on my podcast obviously would be a great way to launch it and grow my audience a little more quickly than I would otherwise. Not to mention the fact that I really like both of them and I really wanted to meet them. So James came on the show for episode four. And today I had the pleasure of interviewing Gary Vaynerchuk. But I have to tell you, I almost missed my moment. We were scheduled to record at 1 p.m. and it was about 10 after 12 when I heard my computer shut off and back on again. You know, that Apple sound. And I looked at my computer and it did it again. And I thought, oh no, there must be some like weird power surge or something happening. Not today of all days. Then I saw the dreaded Apple logo and that white progress bar. And that's when I realized that my computer was doing an operating, what do you call it? Operating system update without my permission. So whenever I get that thing from Apple that says there's a new update, I will click remind me tomorrow um, for like two weeks until I finally can find time to do it. And I knew, I knew that this morning I had done that. I set it to remind me tomorrow, but It didn't care and it downloaded anyway. So there was nothing I could do but wait. And I waited and I waited and I had to decide whether I was going to jump ship and move to my other computer, which was not set up for this interview in any way, shape or form, or if I should wait it out. I decided I had to move. So I moved everything to my second computer, but I couldn't remember my Skype password. I had to get a password reset. And I had to download the tool for recording the Skype interview. That was 40 bucks. Couldn't find my credit card. Couldn't remember my PayPal address. Starting to panic. I unscrewed the boom mic that is attached to my desk on the other side and moved it to the, to the new side. I moved my microphone and had to make sure that Skype was picking it up. Then I had to move my giant backdrop in case Gary V decided to do video. So after doing all that, With about 10 minutes left on the clock, my other computer comes alive again. So I decided to move it all back again, and I was really feeling a bit panicky and flustered. But by the time the Skype call came in from Gary V, I was ready. I was absolutely thrilled that when I opened the call that he was on video, I was just really thrilled about that and uh, because I could see him and he could see me. But there's one point uh, in the interview where you will hear me asking him what he's doing, and that's because he was really all fidgety in his chair, um, which is why I asked, and uh, you'll hear his reply. So I took the challenge just to catch you up. I took the challenge. You were on uh, James Altucher's podcast, and you put it out there, and I took it, and um and thank you for the kick in the butt. It's been a total game changer for me. Did you uh, did you get a bunch of takers? Yes, I think we did. I'm like 
actually scared that I made that claim because I don't know what's actually out there of like people that I actually deserve I owe podcasts to. Right. So I'm nervous <laughs> to show up on the blog because now it was like, no, no, I took the challenge too. So you, you will represent everybody that I, I'm going to tell. I'm much busier than James, so I think James has to do the rest. Okay. So. All right. Well, I'll tell. I'll tell him. I'll tell him that. Um, <laughs> all right. So this led me to other things. So after this, I was like, wow, I really like this. I really like this medium. So I started doing flash briefings because I found these guys that are basically like the Libsyn of flash briefings where it takes like one minute to get it up. And then I read your chapter in your book last night, uh, in, in crushing it all about you're calling it voice first. Are you going to use that? Is that term for like flash briefings or all voice? That to me, uh, look, I think voice is kind of a term I'm using for podcasting and flash briefings and Google and Apple HomePod and like all the stuff that's coming with voice. And so on that note, do you, do you think pod is going to do, let us do briefings as well? Oh and- yeah. I mean, home, Apple and Google and Amazon, all these people, their business is to create a platform that let people build on top of it. And then make a percentage of the action. Okay. Let's see. I also want to ask you, so before this podcast, I was, I was very nervous and I was telling my friend, like, I'm really nervous. And then I said, but I just have to remember that you're just a human being and you put on your pants one leg at a time. And my friend was like, I don't know. I'm not so sure about that. That's fine. I jumped in my pants. That's exactly what he said. He's like, I think he jumps into his pants. (laughs) Um, So, but then that got me thinking, like, what do you, what do you do in the morning? Uh, I wake up, I grab my phone, I go take a poop, I make sure everything's on fire in the world of my world. You know, my biggest thing, look, when you're the, when you're the CEO of a thing, it's your fault. You're the last line of defense. And so that's the tough spot and the fun spot. And so really my morning is really interesting, right? Like it's funny. I can actually break down my morning. The first thought that runs through my mind is, am I tired? Like, did I get the sleep that I needed? today to go hard and like the good news is like that I'm in a good place nine out of ten times and then the one time that I'm not then I'm like oh I hope that my workout today is going to wake me up or make me feel better so I love that I work out now because whereas I used to not have that and like struggle through the first couple hours and then my adrenaline would kick in now usually it's very rare for me to like be tired and go through a workout and not be ready for the day right um, but the biggest thing I do is I check on fires. I make sure nothing happened in London. Don't forget it's five or six hours ahead of me. So even when I wake up at six, um, they're already, you know, well into their day and there could be a, a problem. Um, and so, and overnight in LA, right? You know, if I go to sleep at midnight, it's still only nine there. Clients are still doing things. So um, I, I make sure there's no problems. What are you um, doing right now? I'm sorry. I'm, to I'm rolling a bat. On my lower left back, okay. I'm fixing my lower left back muscle issues and tissue quality, and it's been a very weird, you know, couple of weeks for my team watching me like do all sorts of weird things with my back. But it's really good. I've uh, for everybody who's watching right now, tissue quality. I don't know if people know this. Your brain protects you from like your most inefficient physical attributes and creates huge inefficiencies by protecting you. And I've realized how limited I was in my rotation and bending and stretching. And, and it's not about, you know, yoga and massages. This is like real fucking tissue work. Like you got to really like do it, but it's been amazing. And I'm getting, I've had a bad back for like 25 years and I'm like this close. I'm like on the final pieces right now, which is why I'm like, I'm taking this huge piece of wood, right? It's a half a baseball bat. Okay. Ramming it into my back like ramming my back. Where did you get this idea? Like, did someone recommend it to you or do you just thought this looks like something that would work? Uh, no, my, uh, my trainer, Jordan, we roll, we roll on a hard ball, a lacrosse ball. We have a, we have a stick. This is not something he recommends. This is just, I know this is working because I'm beating up the muscle. Like I can feel what's happening. You know, it's amazing. Back to your morning routine for just a second. Like, okay, I want to know how long you, how long it takes you to reach for your phone and like, do you stay in bed and read your tweets? Are you up immediately? And if you didn't have to get up early, would you naturally be a morning person or a night person? If I didn't have to wake up early, I'd be naturally a night person. Uh, I grab the phone and I'm usually, I never lay in bed. Like I'm up, I grab the phone, I go in a drink of water, go to the bathroom. Like 
Like it's like I'm usually like after I wake up, I'm in, I'm out of bed within seconds. Um, um, usually because I try to maximize sleep. So like I've got to go. Like I've gone to the extreme of like I've got to work out in four minutes. Like I've got to go to the bathroom, like brush my teeth, put on gym clothes, and get downstairs. Like I keep it tight. Um, so I would naturally be a night person. I like to get work done at like midnight, one, two, three. I don't like the morning. Um, I wake up way earlier than I used to. There was a time where I was such an extreme night person building a wine library, I'd go to sleep at three or four and not get into wine library until 11. That happened for like a year. That's how extreme I went. But now I get up at six or seven um, and that's how I roll. Okay. So I also want to ask you, like I, we get the sense, all the people who love and adore you and you may be the people even who don't, uh, that we really know you because, you know, you're everywhere. Um, yeah. And, and I really do feel like we, we do know you to some degree, yeah. but what, yeah. what will we be surprised to know about you that we don't know? You don't know anything about my family. That's right? true. I'm you bad. really don't talk about that. No, but, I mean like, you know, nothing about my kids or my wife or I spend very little on that. We keep that private. So you guys don't know that part of me. And I think the part that most, I think the part that most people don't know about me is all of you, anybody that likes or dislikes me, but more likes me, has to keep a percentage to themselves to keep them protected from me not letting them down, right? When somebody right. admires or likes somebody, there's a protective mechanism that everyone has, which is, man, I really hope he's like that in real life, right? That's right. So it's been really, really bad. And what about you? That happened, right? Did you, when you first started working here, there was a part of you like, oh, I hope he's that real in real life. Like, like right? Like, you know, like, and you didn't have the same dynamic because I was in a different place. So nonetheless, like, I think the biggest thing that people don't know about me is that I think I'm even nicer in real life than I project. Okay. So you that's. Because I see it. Right, because you see the real stuff that I can't show where I'm being really nice, but it's inappropriate for me to show it because it may look, make look the other person look a little weird. All right. Well, that's like the perfect lead into this question that I'm dying to ask you or just I want to mention because like it really I saw this the other day where you said that like you're in this unique position where you have like crossed the chasm into like being cool for the younger people. And yes. my 17 year old son like is, you know, completely hangs on your every word. Um, yes. And I have to quote it exactly because it was so good. You said um, you said if I can achieve making self-awareness and patience and gratitude and empathy cool characteristics of an alpha male, I will have made a real impact. And I thought, God, that is like for all the moms and dads that are probably so mad at you that their kids are changing their minds about college, like yes. that you probably get just as many love letters or more after a statement like that. But then, but then I'm like, can we really do that? And like, what would it take to really make those things cool without it just being like a good quote? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm doing it. Like, I, you know, with me, my quotes come after I've already done something. I would have never had the audacity to say something that ludicrous if I hadn't started seeing it actually start to happen. That's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, like, I mean, it's, it is amazing. Like, I, I really think it's very special when somebody comes along and is a great communicator and can move people's minds and does it for good. I mean, because... Some do it for good, some do it for bad, and some never realize they can do it. You know, why do you, you know, think about how excited I am about both your 17 year old son and you. For your 17 year old son, I'm going to create a new paradigm of cool, and hopefully that will work. And for you, like I inspired you to do. Yes, and, now you're, and now you're finding out something that you're doing that you enjoy and you may be good at. That's incredible. Yeah, thank you. Uh <laughs> It's, 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 it's cool. It, I, I talk about it as if it's not even me living it because it's almost too heady for me to like, I, I'm being serious right now. I try not to overthink it because it becomes a little daunting if you realize you're sitting on a superpower, right? So I try to like take it for what it is. I try to make my, you know, to, the truth is I actually think it's a bigger indication of my parents and my environment than it is on me. So I don't get big headed about it. I'm, I know my intent is to do the best I can. I don't feel daunted by the responsibility. I don't feel like it's my, I don't think I'm that special that I have to change the world, but I'm more than interested in trying. <laughs> I love it. Well, I mean, I would imagine that 
if you did think about it too hard, it would get kind of like um, scary or I don't know, maybe it would feel like a burden. And, and you teach us to like, really, we just should care immensely about everything, but not, but not give a crap about what people say. But I, but I wonder, like, don't you, don't you ever get your feelings hurt? Like, I, I would imagine that your feelings have to get hurt. I get my feelings hurt every day in like a fake way. Like I'm a human. Right. I'm just not very emotional when it comes to this because I understand the score. I'm unbelievably emotional. I'm, I'm completely unemotional. Like I have, I think I have this great balance that's coming from extreme characteristics. So any, t- I mean, you know, I mean, there was a, there was a engagement I had today on Twitter where two guys in Europe or somewhere not in the U S I, I kind of quickly glanced who I think were from the advertising industry were making fun of me. Like one of them put a picture of me where it says, hustle your fucking face off. And he said something to the degree of like, this is an actual quote. Like, can you fucking believe this guy? And his buddy or, or a, a similar thinking guy jumped in and said, like, or, and I think he said, try to find a quote that's more ludicrous than this kind of thing. And then his buddy found one, but I don't think that was a real quote because the other one was real. But just took a picture of me and put some ridiculous quote that I think I did say. Like, bottom line is they were bantering. I jump in because my feelings are hurt because I don't know. I like, I want these two guys to like me, not think I'm a douchebag. I reply with, with my true feeling, which is like, yo, guys, can you stop creating ammo for my friends to make fun of me with? Um, and I wish you good health and like, I hope you get to share a glass of wine because I know this one guy's from Australia. I like Australian wines. It was interesting. The other guy, one of the guys, I didn't, and then I got to the office. I didn't see if the other guy is engaged. One guy jumped in and said, touche or fair enough. Like, if you're ever in Australia, let's grab that glass. And I loved it because like, it's less that my feelings are hurt. It's that I respect everybody else's opinions, no matter who they are, even within my own success. Like, I think I'm going to be all time, yet I don't believe that your or your 17-year-old sons or those two guys' opinions are any less valuable than mine. I just think my ultimate superpower is empathy at the highest level. I think I'm so empathetic that it that everything else I am is almost secondary, even though I have a lot of other strong characteristics, strengths and weaknesses. Um, so, of course, my feelings are hurt because I'm so empathetic. Yet I'm so self-aware and confident that it's not able to fully penetrate and become a a negative. I think it becomes a positive because I know how to calibrate the pushback or the name calling. So obviously some of that is innate and you were born with that. And then the other part is you had great parents. Yes. But who else? Circumstance, right? I lost a lot as a kid. Right. I speak the language. We had no money. I wasn't a great athlete. I was a terrible student. I've lived my first 18 years of my life as a fucking loser, which made the next fucking 100 years super easy because I wasn't scared of losing. A lot of people are coddled. A lot of people are eighth place trophies. A lot of people didn't deal with adversity because they figured out how to run the school model and were straight A students gifted with talent in sports. And so they were winning their first 18 years. So when they go into real life with inevitable losses, especially for somebody who like pandered to the system, which means they then go work in a corporation where they have no control and merit doesn't ride, you know, I'm the reverse. Were you, you said you were losing the first 18 years, but I have a sense that you were probably like a popular kid in school. Were you? You were very popular. And, And that part has never gone away. I was popular for, uh, you know, I have charisma, so that's always good. I was popular because I was super nice. Like nice has been, you know, over the last week or two, I've started pushing kindness and nice. It's funny. You know, like I I feel like almost just like I figured out my back was hurt after I figured my adductor was hurt and my knee and my neck and like my shoulder. I feel like I'm just going through my life and discovering, wait a minute, it's not just hustle. Wait a minute, it's not just sales. Wait a minute, it's not just empathy. Like, and I feel like somewhere literally within the last 10 days, I'm like, huh, kindness is probably a real big reason this is all working out for me. And so in school, my kindness was amazing because I was so self-confident that I wasn't willing to make fun of kids when that's what the cool kids did. And that in a weird way over time made me quite popular with a lot of people. Oh my God. I just thought of the name of your new book. It's crush them with kindness instead of. (laughs) It's just kill. kill him with kindness, crush him with kindness. That's it. Just send me like 1%. That's all I need. 
I think kindness is something that I will continue to tap into this year. This will be the year of kindness in my content. I can feel it. And I'm excited about that because self-awareness and gratitude and work ethic and honor, I think is something that an alpha male can kind of like get there to. Kindness, being sweet, being a sweetheart is just not necessarily uh, the thing that I think people... um, naturally gravitate towards. And it's funny, my public persona, AKA when I do interviews and speeches, I wouldn't say is filled with kindness. I'm my most combative and competitive. It's that my real life is so filled with kindness and sweetness. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how I tap into this and how I articulate it. Oh, wow. I just can't wait to see where this goes. I think that's amazing. And it's funny because my the other challenger, uh, James Altucher, when he came on the show, I asked him, you know, have you had situations where you've interviewed people who are, you know, winners or they're these big guys um, who are really like jerks? And he said, you know, not really. I have one or two, he said, but the truth is people don't get that far usually by being super jerks. So and definitely not people who are are playing in a game that is based on merit, like entrepreneurship. Right. Right. Like like it's a little bit easier to navigate through corporate, which is a lot of what we're seeing now in the world, because you can be protected because the market isn't fair. It's hedged by the tastemakers and the gatekeepers. But like the the more entrepreneurial, the more fair it is to James's point, the more likely you have to be a decent person. And definitely if you want to build something really big for the long haul, like I'm trying to build an absolute business empire and be admired. And like that is a, uh, that is a very, um, zero sum game. Like either you are kind and talented or you're not. Who would it mean the most to you besides your parents and your kids and everybody? Uh, who would it mean the most for you to be admired by? I mean, like anyone specifically that like you've got filed away that you're like, yeah. yeah. Probably Brandon Warnicky. He runs Wine Library. He's my best friend. To me, to me, it's very simple. I want to be admired by the people that know me the best because they actually know the truth. Like it's super more important to me that Tyler and Tyler, who's sitting across from me right now, my admin and one of the guys who's on my content team who films me often, it's much more important to me that they blindly think I'm the best than an employee at Vayner that's not interacting with me more than once or twice a year because they know. And I was watching you walk through your office and all those, I guess, hundreds of employees. And I thought, because you are your brand and because you are such a strong brand and because people gravitate to you, I'm sure that's one of the big selling points that they want to come and work for you, but not everybody can get that access to you. So I, I, I bet that's a huge challenge for you to figure out how you're going to divvy up Gary to your, yes, to all those yes people. And, yes and no. I think, um, I think that a lot of them actually want to just work at a great agency and, uh, haven't gotten into, don't need, there's some people that are even weirdly, not oblivious, but really don't know the extent of what's happening out there with my life in that realm. And that's great because I'll be honest with you. I associate much more to Gary Vaynerchuk, the CEO of VaynerX, VaynerMedia, than I do as Gary V. I, I associate more to being Gary Vaynerchuk, the guy behind the strategy of Gary V than Gary V. And then look, Gary V is me. Like it's, it's, it's my energy when I'm trying to talk to the world. Um, but most of my life is spent not talking to the world <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I do the best I can. I mean, I think that's just important as a CEO, let alone as a personality. Um, I think the people that are most bought into me, fans get their way into spending time with me because they can't hold out, right? They ask for the meeting, they, they hover around, they hang out. So, um, or some just kind of wait and wait for their moment. But, um, it's, again, it's not something I, I kill myself with. I'm a marketer in a sea of digital marketers. I think I'm special or I think that I'm different because of the level of service and care and love that I give to the people who are in my um, orbit. Yep. Uh, yep. But I'm not niche down. I, I do know the value of it. I wish so badly that I could just like find a niche. Do you think that it's uh, – yeah. I, I, I don't want to niche my audience either because I don't want to do just like lawyers. Nope. Your niche is you. My, I'm not niche. My niche is that it's me and my perspective and my efforts and me. There's nothing more niche than being the human being. Okay, that's awesome. 
<laughs> That's so awesome. Okay, thank you. This episode of the Front Row Entrepreneur Podcast has been brought to you by the Front Row VIP, a private membership community where members enjoy all of the latest, greatest, and most practical tips and strategies for building an online business. This membership includes live coaching calls, a library of fresh step-by-step trainings, and a support community unlike any you will find anywhere. At the time of this recording, membership is open for a crazy low rate of $37 a month. You could go to frontrowvip.com to learn more.